Hey folks, before we get into today's podcast, I wanted to share that InfoQ's International Software Development Conference, QCon, will be back in San Francisco from October 2nd through 6th. QCon will share real-world technical talks from innovative senior software development practitioners on applying emerging patterns and practices to address current challenges. Learn more about the conference at qconsf.com. We hope to see you there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this podcast. Greetings from the InfoQ AML and the Data Engineering team and a special guest. We are recording our podcast for the 2023 Trends Report. This podcast is part of our annual report to share with our listeners what's happening in the AI, ML and data engineering space. My name is Srini Penchikala. I serve the team as the lead editor for the AI, ML and data engineering community at InfoQ. I will be facilitating our conversation today. We have an excellent panel for today's podcast with subject matter experts and practitioners in the AI, ML and data engineering areas. Let's first start with their introductions. I will go around our virtual room and ask the panelists to introduce themselves. We will start with our special guest, Sherin Thomas. Hi, Sherin. Thank you very much for joining us and taking part in this podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell our listeners what you've been working on? Hey, folks. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Sherin. I'm a staff engineer at a fintech company called Chime. I'm based in San Francisco. Before this, I spent a little bit of time at Netflix, before that Lyft, Twitter, Google. And for the last six years or so, I've been building data platforms, data infrastructure, and I have a keen interest in streaming, been active in the Flink community, and very recently have also been thinking a lot about data discoverability, governance, operations, and the role data plays in new advancements in AI. In my free time, I have been advising nonprofits working in the climate change area, basically helping them architect their software stack and so on. So yeah, again, very excited. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Next up, Roland. Hey, yes, my name is Roland Meertens. I am working at a company called Bumble, which is making dating apps. So I am literally a date and data scientist, and I'm mostly working with computer vision. So that's my background. Thank you, Roland. Daniel? Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here for another year. I'm Daniel. I'm an engineer. I have experience in software product development. I have been working with companies from Silicon Valley startups to Fortune 500. I'm AWS Community Builder on Machine Learning as well. And my current company, we're developing artificial intelligence and machine learning products for different industries. Thank you. And Anthony? Hi, I'm Anthony Alford. I'm a director of development at Genesis, where we make cloud-based customer experience and contact center software. In terms of AI, you know, I've done several projects there, customer experience related. And back in the 20th century, I actually studied robotics in graduate school and did intelligent robot software control. So I'm really excited to talk about some of the advancements there today. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to this podcast. I am looking forward to speaking with you about what's happening in the AIML engineering, right? And maybe I should say what's not happening, right? So where we currently are and more importantly, what's going to be coming up that our listeners should be aware of and uh, should be keeping an eye. So before we go to the main podcast discussion, a quick housekeeping information for our listeners. There are two major components to these 10 reports. The first part is this podcast, which is an opportunity for you to listen to the panel of expert practitioners on how the new and innovative technologies are disrupting the industry and how you can probably leverage them in your own applications. The second part of the 10 report is a written article, which will be available on InfoQ website. It will contain the trends graph, which is one of my favorite content on on the website. This trend graph will highlight the different phases of technology adoption, and it also provides more details on individual technologies that have been added or updated since last year's podcast. So I recommend everyone to check out the article as well as, of course, this podcast uh, when the article is published. Back to the podcast discussion, there are so many interesting topics to talk about, but let's start with the big elephant in the AIML technology space. That is the generative AI, or also known as Gen AI, a large language models, the LLMs, which these Gen AI is based out of. And of course, the ChatGPT, right? Who hasn't heard about ChatGPT? So generative AI has been getting a lot of attention since GPT-3 was announced a couple of years ago, and especially since GPT-4 and ChatGPT came out earlier this year. 
So ChatGPT was used by 170 plus million people in the first two months of its release. So it has kind of taken over pretty much every other technology and solution in terms of faster adoption. So all the big players in this space have announced their plans for Gen AI. We know that ChatGPT is from OpenAI. Other than that, Google also announced Bard, their uh, AI solution. And Meta AI released Llama 1 and Llama 2. So there's a lot of activity happening in this space. So in this podcast, you know, we want to highlight the value and benefits these technologies bring to the users, not just all the hype that's out there. So Anthony and Roland, I know you both have been working on or focusing on these topics. Anthony, would you like to kick off the discussion on Gen AI and how it's taking the industry by the storm? Also for our listeners who are new to this, can you start by defining what is generative AI, what is an LLM, and why are they different from the traditional machine learning and deep learning techniques? Yeah, so I actually was trying to think, what is a good definition of generative AI? I don't think I have one. I don't know, Roland, do you have a good definition? No, I was actually surprised because I was at a conference about AI a couple of weeks ago and they were running a parallel session, like they were running a separate conference on generative AI. And I was surprised because I love the field. I've been giving talks about generative AI for years now. And I just didn't know it was such a big topic that it would warrant its own separate conference. So I think that's what people normally nowadays use as generative AI is just all AI based on auto-completing a certain prompt. So you start with a certain input and you just see what the AI makes up with it. And this is super powerful in terms of you can do zero-shot learning, you can take your data and turn it into actionable written-out language. There's so many options you have here. Yeah, so I think that's what I would take as a definition. What's interesting, you know, we kind of think of this as new, but looking back, it didn't start that recently. Generative adversarial network models or GANs for image generation have been around for almost 10 years. And it seems like the language models just all of a sudden caught fire, I think probably in 2019 when GPT-2 came out and OpenAI said, we're not going to release this to the general public because it's too dangerous. Now they <laughs> they changed their tune on that. But you know, 2020 was GPT-3 and 2021 was DALI, a different kind of image generator. But I think the, just the second half of 2020, things just took off. And so we're talking about large language models a lot, but the image ones were hotter in the summer of 2022, the stable diffusion. And so we've got both now, you know, we've got the generative AI for images, we've got generative AI for text. People are putting them together and having chat GPT create the prompts for the image generation to tell a story and illustrate it. So we're starting to see humans cut out of the loop there all together. <laughs> so... What are your thoughts on what's next, you know? Yeah, from my side, what I notice is this massive improvement in the generation of the text itself. So ChatGPT really took a step up with GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 is for me in a whole different ballpark. You can very clearly see amazing improvements for the generation itself. Again, it's just larger networks, more data, higher quality data. And I was kind of amazed that everybody now started adopting it. And because we talked about this technology last year, a year ago, when it was not such a big thing, and already on a very good level and very usable. And I think what we can see is that with ChatGPT, the usability experience makes that now everybody is using it, including my father. He's a big adopter of ChatGPT, and he is not a technical person. He emailed me because his URL I bookmarked for him broke. But so everybody can now use it. And what I find amazing about the state of the art in image generation is that for me, the clear winner at the moment is Midjourney. They have absolutely the best generated images, in my opinion. But the way you work with it is that you have to type your prompts in Discord to a bot. The company, I think, only has seven, seven employees at the moment. So there's no usability. And still, it's so good that people are happily paying the $35 a month it costs to have a subscription and are still happily working with it. So I think that in terms of trends, once we go over this hurdle of it being difficult to use, once that goes open to the general public as well, that will be an amazing revolution. I think all this storm that has been happening with ChatGPT, it's amazing because as Roland said, I mean, everyone is using it. 
For example, right now we're doing a project internally in, in the company for one client, and we did all of this generate AI for his own solution. And obviously we use the GPT technology, we use TensorFlow, we use the, the Da Vinci models. And at the end, the, the client said, but what is the difference between this and ChatGPT? And we said, ChatGPT has the same technology, it's a product, but we're using the same technology for your own product. But the thing is that when you mention artificial intelligence or generative AI, ChatGPT is, is, I mean, it's the same that when you say you don't serve the web, you Google it. So right now with ChatGPT is like, you need something on artificial intelligence, you use ChatGPT. And that's the magic of OpenAI, obviously being the first one on the market with this. And as we're going to see, there are a lot of companies and there are a lot of competence right now regarding the generative AI. But right now with ChatGPT is like the synonym of generative AI and the thing that everybody knows how to use and the thing that everybody's using right now. Yeah, and to me, what's interesting is how a new cottage industry of little companies built on top of generative AI are cropping up, like everything from homework assignments to code generation, all kinds of things. So for me, I'm really interested in like all these creative things, like creative ways people use this. So yeah, I'll be staying tuned for that. What I find amazing is that there are now a couple of companies. I see this happening on LinkedIn. I see this happening with my friends who are in big companies. These companies are now creating their own vision, their own roadmap for how they are going to use generative AI. And I'm so eagerly waiting to see more companies apply it because we already mentioned this last year, but the playing field is wide open for everyone who wants to use these APIs. People just need to find a way to add value to people's lives, which goes beyond just the simple cookie cutter approach everyone is now getting with ChatGPT. And I think people will come up with applications we cannot even dream of existing right now. And it's so easy to integrate this into your product. So I'm very excited about this. I think there's just more room for creativity at the moment than there are technological hurdles. So yeah, I'm really hoping to see more companies experiment. In terms of trends, what's interesting is when GPT-3 came out, the value proposition was it does not need to be fine-tuned. It works great with just in-context learning. But now we're starting to see with these large language models in particular, people are fine-tuning them, especially the smaller and open source ones like Llama. People are using those, they're fine-tuning those. We're starting to see things like with Google's Palm model, they did their own fine-tuning. They created a version for medicine. They created a version for cybersecurity. So they're fine-tuning for specific domains. It's getting easier to do, you know, because the models are so large, you need pretty hefty hardware to do that, as well as you need a bit of a data set. But we're starting to see those models shrink a bit, and now people have the ability to fine-tune them themselves. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. Yeah, I just want to chime in. Anthony, I was also looking at who actually are using the companies that we know of, right, uh, ChatGPT. The list is pretty long, you know, so it starts with Expedia, the travel services company to Morgan Stanley, to Stripe, to Microsoft, Slack, and so on. So the adoption is increasing, but like you said, you know, so we have to see how these adoption evolves over the time, right? So any other trends you guys are seeing that are kind of interesting to our listeners? I don't know if we got into prompt engineering, you know, Roland mentioned prompts a little bit. Yeah, we can go to that one. So do you have any comments on that, Anthony, on prompt engineering and how? Yeah, one of the most interesting developments to me was the idea of the so-called chain of thought prompting. So if researchers were using these language models, they found that if you tell it, explain your thoughts step by step, the results came out a lot nicer. So that's been something that was built into some of the models like Palm, where you can get a very big variation in the quality of your results based on your prompt. And it's similar for the image generation as well. Depending on what you tell the model, you can get quite a bit different result. And also prompt engineering, you know, the way I'm kind of understanding it is going to be a discipline in its own, right? In its own way. So I'm kind of wondering how prompt engineering responsibility or role or whatever our tasks will be integrated into the traditional software development process, right? So would we have a dedicated prompt engineer in each project? You know, so to help the team with, you know, how to do things, right? So does anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, maybe to go the other direction or maybe to go against what you think might be happening. I think that the miracle is that 
everyone is using this at the moment. So I think there will be as many prompt engineers in your team later as there are Google engineers who are helping you Google things. Like that would be ridiculous, right? Everybody has somehow learned how to do this. There's no class about this in high school. I don't think there will be a need for a prompt engineer in class. Everybody will know this at some point. Except, of course, your grandmother, who by then will do the opposite thing. Instead of typing in Google, how can I bake the best cookies? And she learns best cookie recipe. She will now go to JGPT and just type best cookies. And JGPT has no clue what to do with it. Yeah, I think it will become part of our uh, lingo, I guess, right? So, okay. We talked about ChatGPT mainly today, but we also mentioned Llama from Meta and Bard from Google, right? And also there is another product called Cloud. I haven't done much research on this. Does anybody know how it's different from others? And also Amazon is now with Amazon Bedrock. Is they're based on, on generative AI. So that's also another one which we should also take a look to this year what is going to happen with that. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. So what do you guys think about the next for LLMs? It's going so fast, you know, we don't even know where we'll be in like six months or one year. Well, you know, what I mentioned, the smaller models and people shrinking them and doing the low rank, <laughs> I can't remember what the A is for, <laughs> but distilling and shrinking the models. And especially, for example, you know, open AI language models are quite famously not available for you to download, whereas Meta has been releasing theirs. Meta has released Llama. Now people give them a hard time about the license. It's a non-commercial license, but still they give you the weights and people are taking those and fine tuning them. So we have a proliferation of these takeoff names from Llama, like Vicuña and Alpaca and so forth. So people are fine tuning these models. They're smaller than ChatGPT. They're not as good, but they're pretty good. And so that lets companies who have concerns about using a closed API, you know, sending data out to who knows what, that lets them alleviate that concern. I think that's a pretty interesting trend. I expect it will continue. Another one, and then I'll let you all chime in, is the sequence length. You know, that's how much history you can put into the chat. And as we know, the output of the language model is really one word. Right? It's one token. You give it a history, it outputs one token, the next token. Then you got to put it all the way back in. They're autoregressive. Eventually, you run out of that context, it's called. GPT-4 has a version that supports up to 32,000 tokens, which is quite a bit. And there's more research into supporting maybe up to a million tokens. At that point, you could basically put Wikipedia almost as the, maybe not, but you could put a book as the context. And that's the key for this so-called in-context learning. You could give it a whole book and have it summarize, answer questions. You could give it your company's knowledge base and you could ask questions of it. So I think these two trends are going to help bring these models and their abilities into the enterprise, into premise, maybe whatever you want to call it, basically out of the walled garden. I can definitely see that changing the adoption, right, in a positive way. So if companies can use some of the solutions within their own environments, can be on-premise or can be in the cloud, but with more flexibility, that will change the name of the game, right? So So speaking about summarizing, this is a trend that I'm seeing quite a bit. Like a lot of law firms are using this to summarize legal documents. And then I've been working with a group called Collaborative Earth, where, you know, scientists are, you know, they are looking at like, you know, papers and there are like 30,000 papers and they need to understand, you know, some... uh, pull tags out of this. So that's another area where I see a lot of application of this and people are onboarding this trend of summarizing papers and documents. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Sharin. The other one uh, I know we can talk about is like a speech synthesis, right? So how can we use these two solutions, you know, for analyzing the speech data, right? So Anthony, do you have some thoughts on this? What's interesting is that both Google and Meta seem to be working quite hard on this. They've both released several different models just this year. Of course, OpenAI released Whisper at the end of last year, and they actually did basically open source that. And Whisper is quite good you know, for speech synthesis. Meta and Google, they're doing multilingual things in particular. So Google is doing speech to speech translation. So You know, it does the speech recognition of one language and does the output of it in speech synthesis in another language. And in my industry in particular, people are excited about that because you could have an agent on the phone with a customer. Maybe they don't speak the same language, but with this in the middle, 
is it's like Hitchhiker's Guide, right? It's the thing in the ear that can do automatic translation for you. That's pretty exciting. The other one recently that came out with Meta released one called Voice Box, and it basically does, in images, we'd call it in painting, but basically it can take a speech audio and kind of replace bits of it. So it could take a podcast like this and edit out a barking dog. It could change what I say from saying, you know, I love AI to like, I don't like AI or something like that. So they're in the situation OpenAI was in where they're not sure they want to release this because they're not sure how it could be abused. So if you guys hear me say something that you don't think I would say, well, blame AI. Oh, that's going to add that new dimension to the deep fake, right? So Exactly. It's literally what it is. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I know it kind of brings a lot of ethical and responsible AI consequences. Anthony, we'll go to that topic later in the podcast, but it's a good one to keep in mind. Anybody else have any comments on the speech side of the AI? Yes, I remember that I wrote an article on that on InfoQ with the update of the Google AI regarding the universal speech model which has the 1,000 language initiative. It's going to be huge, all of these things happening. And obviously for all the products that are also involved with speech, for example, the, the Google products or Alexa, all that stuff, there's going to be a whole new way of products with all this artificial intelligence and with all these models once they are implemented on their own hardware and on their product. So it's going to be amazing to see what is going to happen in now asking Alexa or now asking Google to give better insights or better answers based on the prompts on the voice that we're giving on those products. So that's something that eventually is going to have a lot of improvement on the product side for these companies. So with all this innovation happening with text data, speech and images, right? So with large language models, billions of parameters. So once we start seeing a lot of this adoption and these applications, you know, the enterprise applications are deployed in production, whether they're on-premise or in the cloud, one big thing that teams will need to own and maintain will be the operation side, right? So there is this new LLM ops term coming up. So what does operations mean for LLM-based applications? Sherin, I know you have some thoughts on this, so please go ahead and share with us, you know, what you think, what's happening here. Yeah, so the ML ops kind of brings rigor to the whole process of building and launching pipelines. So in that sense, those same operational requirements apply to LLMs as well. But I see that there are some nuances or some requirements for LLMs that make that a little bit more challenging, or we need to think a little bit differently about operationalizing LLMs. So I guess one is maybe around collecting human feedback for reinforcement learning, maybe prompt engineering, as we discussed, that is going to be a big piece that will be coming up. And then also like performance metrics for LLMs are kind of different. And this is a very, you know, constantly emerging area right now. So we don't even know how this is going to like pan out in the future. So that might completely differ. Also, like the whole LLM development life cycle consists of the data ingestion, data prep, prompt engineering. There may be some complex tasks of, you know, like chaining LLM calls that make also external calls, like a knowledge base to answer question and answer. So this whole life cycle requires some rigor. And from that sense, I feel like LLM ops might just end up being its own little thing with ML ops being just like a subset of it. Yeah, definitely. I think that will become more critical, you know, when we have significant number of apps using these LLM languages, right? So anybody else have any other thoughts on that? What LLM ops should look like? I think definitely that's something that is going to be increasing on the industry and in the companies because, for example, right now with the clients that we're working, it's like, but it's artificial intelligence, so that's done, you know, that's artificial intelligence problem or whatever. But even though you have to consider that behind that artificial intelligence, you have a team, you have to tune out the data, you have to work continually in the prompt engineering, you have to continue to see what is happening on the server, on, the, on those architecture and that stuff. So it's not like thinking that the artificial intelligence is there and is doing everything. No, behind that, that artificial intelligence, obviously, there will be a team doing all this stuff to make sure that the artificial intelligence at the end should work correctly, you know, and the artificial intelligence to work correctly, there should be a team behind making sure that all these things happening like out of the space are working correctly. Right. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, yeah, we can switch our focus here a little bit. The other area that's getting a lot of attention is the vector database technology, the embedded stores, right? So I have seen a lot of use cases on this. One of them, interestingly, is the using the sentence embedding approach to create a observability solution for generative AI applications, right? So Roland, do you have any thoughts on this? I think you mentioned this in the past, vector databases. 
Yeah, maybe let's first start with the question, why do you need a vector search database? As we already mentioned, at the moment, these large language models have a limited history of, I heard Anthony say, 33,000 tokens. I mean, that's about half a podcast, maybe a whole podcast. But what if you want to know something about Wikipedia? Or I heard Sharon say, what if you have a lot of legal documents? One thing which I think will happen more and more with companies is that they can make a summary of a certain document that will be stored as a certain feature vector. So like you and I would just write down this document is about X and Y, but of course, large language models can just create a feature vector. And that will maybe leave you with thousands, millions, hundreds of millions, depending on how many documents you have of feature vectors. And if you want to find similar vectors, or maybe you can query your large language model with, hey, I am searching for this document, which probably contains this, you can find a similar feature vector inside these vector databases. So where with normal databases, you're just going through all the documents and finding what is the most relevant document. But once you have too many documents, which are all summarized as features, you want to have a vector search database where you can find the end nearest neighbors of the thing you're searching for. And what I find interesting about this, or what intrigued me as a trend over the last year, is that I saw a tiny increase in adoption from developers' perspective, which is good because these things are amazing. But I saw a massive increase in funding for these technologies. So in this case, it looks like investors have rightfully realized that vector databases are going to be a big part of the future. And somehow developers are kind of lagging behind. It's maybe a difficult topic to get into. So I really think that next year we are going to see more adoption. We are going to see that more people will realize that they have to work with a vector search database such as Pinecone or Milvis. So I think that these technologies will keep growing. Yeah, Gordon, I also heard about Chroma. I think there's an open source solution in the space. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can have a dedicated podcast and interview someone who is working on these technologies. I think the bottom line is that depending on what is in your feature vectors, some things make more sense than others. So depending on what kind of a hyperdimensional space you're searching in, do you have lots of similar data? Do you have data all over the place? You want to use one version or another one. Makes sense. Yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. And you know, feature stores have definitely become a big part of the machine learning solutions. This one now probably will have the same importance. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Vector databases, it's still a kind of emerging area. Yeah, I think, again, the applications of similarity search are also going up. So a couple of years ago, I was working on a side project with NASA FDL where they wanted to ingest. Basically, they applied like self-supervised learning on all the images of the Earth collected from NASA satellites. And when scientists are searching for weather phenomena like hurricane and things like that, they wanted to search other images of hurricanes that happened over time. And that's a problem that they are still trying to solve. And that this was like two, three years ago, we tried using Pinecone AI. And now I've seen that these technologies have like really developed like rapid improvement in the last two years. And at that time, it wasn't there yet. So yeah, this is an amazing space as well. Let's switch to the next topic, which is also very interesting, right? So the robotics and the drone technologies. Roland, I know you have recently published a podcast from the ICRA conference. I have listened to it, a very good podcast, a lot of great information. So would you like to lead the discussion on this, you know, where we are with robotics and drone technologies and what's happening in this space? Yeah, absolutely. From my side, I was super excited to go to this ICRA conference and see what's happening here. So we have a separate podcast on this. And one thing which I think we see as a trend overall in the entire tech industry is that we see less investments also with robotics, which always makes me sad because I think that robotics is a very promising field, but it always needs a lot of money. We do see that Boston Dynamics has started an AI institute, so that seems very promising. And we do see cheaper and cheaper remote control robots besides Boston Dynamics, who are still leading the leg robot race. But a couple of years ago, it was unthinkable that you could buy a legged balancing robot who could walk over some unstable terrain. And nowadays, I think the cheapest ones you can probably get for only $1,500. So it's getting more and more viable to buy a robot as a platform and then integrate with that API to put your own hardware on top of it. So yeah, hopefully we can soon see computers go to places where they have not gone before. And yeah, 
The robot operating system is still seen as leading software with more and more adoption to ROS2. I also have seen one company, Viam, which has started also to build a bit of a middleware where you can easily add some plugins and configure some plugins. So that's exciting. Overall, it's an interesting field with lots of developments, which is always kind of slowly, invisibly moving in the background. Yeah, super exciting. What's interesting to me is how Google in particular has been publishing research where they're taking language models and using them to control robots. They're basically using it as the user interface. So instead of having a planner, you tell the language model, go get me a Coke. And it uses that chain of thought prompting to do step by step down to the basically the robot primitive of you know, drive here, pick up here, come back. I think that's a pretty interesting development as well, especially considering how hard that was for us back in the 90s. Google's also trying to integrate sensor data into this. So I'm not sure why Google is doing robotics research, but they are doing a lot of it, and it's very interesting. I don't know if they had any posters at ICRA or anything like that, Roland. No, but I'm also very interested in this topic. You indeed see that, for example, for planners in the past, you had to say on a map, here is a fridge, and you had to say on a map, here is a couch. So if you have to bring someone a beer, you have to program the commands, walk to the fridge, walk to the couch. But now with these large language models and also with large computer vision models, why not recognize where the fridge is and remember that on some kind of semantic map? And if someone describes it in a different way, why not try to figure out what they could mean? And I think that's very exciting because it's definitely traditionally a very hard world to work in. So I'm very excited to see where we can go next in that domain. Yeah, definitely. I think the one area that can definitely use this, unless it's already using some of this, is the manufacturing, right? So there is the virtual manufacturing platforms. There is the digital twins idea, right? So... So definitely, I think we can bring the physical manufacturing plant, you know, closer to the virtual side and try to do a lot of these things that we cannot afford to do in the physical space because of the cost or the safety and try it out with the virtual and semi-virtual with the drones and the robots, right? So Yeah, but I think with the robot technology, is going to happen the same that happened with other industries that, I mean, everybody knows that there are a lot of research and cool stuff happening. But there's not like a, a real product that people can feel that robot is there. So probably in the next years, for example, Tesla, which is doing with the Optimus robot and his humanoid, that's going to happen. That we're going to start seeing robots more approachable as a product and not only as a research. So I think with all these advances and other things that are happening, we are years ahead of seeing the first robot robots on the streets. Makes sense. Let's jump to the another big item here, right? So with all this power of technologies comes responsibility of being ethical and being fair. So let's get into the whole ethical dimension of this AML technologies. So I know we hear about the bias, the AI hallucinations, the LLM attacks. There are so many different ways, you know, these things can go bad. So Daniel, I know you mentioned about the regulations, you know, how the governments are trying to keep a check on this. So what do you think is happening there and you know what else should happen? Yes, I think obviously, as we talked last time, the technology is really cool. But uh, once we know what is happening with all this cool stuff, we need to consider the, the other aspect, no? and that's where AI ethics is very important. So, for example, we need to consider all the bias and discrimination, so how the AI algorithms can inadvertently perpetuate biases and discriminations on decision-making. We need to take a consideration on the privacy and security, so how, what is the potential risk uh, to personal data and privacy in the need of the robot security systems. We need to consider ethical decisions, so how can we ensure that AI systems make ethical decisions and accurate information. We need to consider all, all this uh, unemployment and economic impact that is going to happen, which is the others in the potential displacement of jobs and economics regarding the AI adoptions, and we need to consider the sustainability because obviously addressing all this environmental impact into the long term with the AI technology is going to have uh, an implications. So I think uh, right now the governments on the different parts of the world are thinking on their own solutions. I don't know from my personal perspective if that's something that is going to, to work because, I mean, the AI is something that is going to affect the entire humanity and it's not only the governments and their citizens in different locations. So probably the things that the United States is thinking regarding the artificial intelligence regulations are different based on the United Kingdom, are different based on the Europe, different on Latin America, different on Asia, different on Japan. 
but probably at the end, it's going to be something that the entire United Nations is going to take care of what is going to happen with humanity, because this is going to affect the entire humanity and not only the citizens of the different countries. So I think we're just starting to see governments taking care and thinking about this responsibility and this regulation. But at the end, it's something that it needs to be done by the entire humanity. Roland, I know you had a podcast on this topic with uh, Meher Nush, right? So do you want to mention that? What were the takeaways from that? Yeah, indeed. So from my perspective, I can really recommend the InfoQ podcast episode with Mernush Simaki, who I interviewed at InfoQ in here in London. And personally, from my perspective, what I find so interesting is that everybody agrees that safety is an important topic in generative AI. But on the other hand, people are also complaining about ChatGPT becoming dumber and dumber, where people say, hey, it's a couple of months ago. It answered this query about medications for me, or it answered this query about acting as my psychologist, and now it refuses to do this. It refuses to do my homework. I don't know what. And I think this is very interesting that I'm also very torn between, whoa, this technology is moving fast. We need to put a hold on it. But then also, I'm also very done with the mandatory starting with, hey, as an AI language model, I cannot do this for you. I know you can. I just want some information. I don't want to listen to you. So I think that's an interesting thing, which we will definitely see as a trend this year, that people will start discussing this more and more. I don't know. That's almost as annoying as having to accept or reject cookies on every site. You mentioned ChatGPT's output. You know, these companies that are serving these language models are, of course, extremely concerned. They, the models often say things that are just not true. Nobody knows what to do about that. They also can say things that are very hurtful or possibly even like criminal. They're trying to put safeguards in there, but they're also really not sure how to guarantee that. I think this is a problem that nobody's really sure how to solve, and it looks like it's going to get worse. I just had an InfoQ news piece where a research team figured out how they could automatically generate these attacks. They could basically automatically come up with prompts that so-called jailbreak, not just chat GPT, but basically any language model. So in a way, obviously, when you do research like this, it's like white hat (laughs) hacking. You know, you're trying to show that there's a problem to hopefully get people to work on it. We'll see, like Roland said, you know, it's already kind of a problem and I think it may just get worse. Yeah, maybe from my perspective, the two things I want to make sure that the listeners take away from the podcast is... I think my two tips are that it's important that we improve the lives of all the people and all your users. So don't just say, oh, but it works for a couple of specific users or it works for me. I think it's always important to make sure that it really works for consider all the possible edge cases you can have on your platform and also consider everything which ChatGPT can do for you, right? So consider both the false positives, but also the false negatives. So this needs to be more ingrained in the minds of people, because if you start using ChatGPT for the first 10 minutes, you're, of course, amazed by all the things it can do. And only if you start digging a bit, you find some false positive cases, you find some false negative cases. If you are creating a new application, which you roll out to the entire world, there will be a lot of false positive and false negatives. So in that sense, of course, it's important to remind users that this was generated by a large language model. And maybe it cannot do all the things for you because at some point you're getting into the more dangerous, iffy waters of what you want a large language model to solve for you. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Yeah, so discrimination, you know, even for one demography or one user is uh, not acceptable, right, in some use cases. Okay. The other similar topic here is the explainable AI. Sherin, you know, would you like to talk about this a little bit, you know, so what is the explainable AI for somebody who's new to this and what's happening in this space? Yeah, so... Explainable AI in a gist is basically a way to explain how a model came to a result or a conclusion. So it could be like, what was the data points it used or how did it make this decision, etc. And I think this is going to take center stage and become really important as we are talking about ethics of AI. And as Daniel mentioned, like how it's a lot of governments are making regulations discussing new laws and when Roland talked about how models sometimes are getting like dumber and we want to know like why is it doing what it's doing and the way I see this might play out like few years ago we saw a big disruption in 
data governance and data privacy automation as a result of GDPR and CCP and those laws coming into the picture. And I see that push happening on the AI explainability side as well. And moreover, we've already seen, you know, some AI fails because of bad data. Famously, there was a, I don't know if you've heard about this, a few years ago, Amazon, I think they were using a model to make decisions to interview people and it disproportionately selected more men because it was trained on last 10 years of data, which was disproportionately men's resumes that were coming to Amazon. So, you know, things like that. So, yeah, so I feel like in this new world of AI explainability, data discovery, lineage, labeling, operation, and good model development practices are all going to become super important. So we can do a quick transition here and talk about some data engineering topics as well. Similar to how AML space has been going through a significant number of developments and innovations, a lot of emerging trends and patterns are happening in the data engineering space as well. So let's look at some of these important topics that our leaders should be looking at in their data management projects. Sherin, I know you have done a lot of work on this and you are probably the expert on these topics in this group. Would you like to talk about what do you see happening in the data side, uh, whether it's data mesh or data observability or even data discovery and data contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few trends that I'm noticing. One is there is a lot of emphasis on speed and low latency. So earlier, most data organizations were batch first and streaming, maybe like 10% of use cases would be like streaming. But now that piece of the pie is increasing. There are a lot of unified batch and streaming platforms coming out. Carpart architecture is gaining adoption. Then data mesh has been a buzzword. As data is increasing and organizations are getting more complex, now it's no longer sufficient for just a central data team to manage everybody's use cases. And data mesh came out of that need. Another buzzword that I'm hearing is data contracts. So a lot of emphasis on measuring data quality, measuring, you know, having data observability. And this is just going to become more and more important with this whole new world of AI that we are entering. So what do you think about data observability, right? Uh, you know, this is definitely becoming a main pattern in the data side. I recently hosted a webinar on data observability and I learned, you know, that it is not what it was, you know, like, you know, a few years ago. Yeah. So earlier when we used to talk about observability, it was mostly around, you know, measuring observability at the systems and infrastructure level. But as we are adding more and more abstractions, so now we talk about data products as an abstraction. And then on top of data products, we have you know, machine learning pipelines. That is another abstraction. So now it's no longer sufficient to have observability just at the systems and infrastructure level. We need observability at those different abstraction layers as well. And as I mentioned earlier, data contracts is a theme that I'm hearing a lot where with data teams getting more and more distributed and with a lot of actors being involved in a whole full life cycle of data ingestion and processing and serving and all of that, it makes sense to have contracts across those boundaries to make sure that it's almost like unit tests. Make sure that you know systems and data products are behaving as expected. I also notice a lot of companies coming up in this space, so Monte Carlo, Anomalo, and one person that I follow, Chad Sanderson, he has a lot of great opinions about the subject. So I encourage if you follow him on LinkedIn, or I think he has a blog as well. And I see with AI, the whole need for data observability is just going to increase. And we talked about AI explainability earlier. So now we want to know like what kind of data are we getting? What is the distribution? All, all sorts of things. And we have heard so many stories of AI fails because of data. So the whole Zillow debacle, and you know, we all, I already spoke about the Amazon recruitment model thing. So now the data observability is also around what type of data or what distribution of data is coming in. It's not just systems and infra. Definitely, I see the data disciplines that you discussed and the AI side we talked about are basically two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to have all of this in place to have the end-to-end -end discipline, right? So to manage the data and machine learning models. Okay, uh, I think we can wrap up with that discussion. I think we had talked about all the significant innovations happening in our space. So we can yeah, go into the wrap up, right? So I have two questions, so you can answer both the questions or pick one question to kind of wrap up, I guess, right? So, and then we will go to the concluding remarks. So the two questions are, what is your one prediction in AI or data engineering space that may happen in one year, right? So when we do this podcast next year, 
So we will actually come back and you know see if that prediction has come true or not. So we will start with Sharon. Yeah. So I think I'm noticing that a lot of companies are feeling that data teams are becoming a bottleneck. So I see data mesh adoption going up in the coming year. So that. And the second part is around explainability. I think that is also an emerging topic. And yeah, I think there might be a lot more adoption in that area. Okay. Anthony? Predictions are hard. Can I make a negative prediction? I predict we will not have artificial general intelligence. I know people think maybe the LLMs are a step on that. Certainly not next year. I'd be surprised if it happens in my lifetime, to be honest, but I'm over the hill. So maybe we'll see. You never know. AGI, right? So, you know. Yeah. I know that was not a very brave prediction, but I'm going to predict no. It's good to know what not's going to happen, right? So Daniel? I think AI is here to stay. I think this year we saw with ChatGPT and all these new things happening and focusing on product base also where people can start using it and massifying all this technology. AI is here to stay. Probably I would say by next year, there's going to be more new cool products, more new cool stuff to use. Uh, I know, for example, Elon Musk is going to start working on artificial intelligence on many of the, the, his own companies. So there are going to be more and more approach to the artificial intelligence for normal people, and not only for the research and for the, the things that we were used to do, which was uh, to read research on papers and all that stuff. But now the artificial intelligence is going to be on more and more products and people are going to start using it more and more. Roland. Yeah, so from my side, the one thing I am personally very excited about is the field of autonomous agents. So right now, you're taking the API of OpenAI or whatever, and you have to feed it prompts, and then you have to connect it to these other APIs. What I'm really excited about are these autonomous agents, where you simply say, maybe come up with an interesting product to sell, and then the autonomous agent will by itself start looking at what's a good product to make. And then it will autonomously email some marketing companies saying, hey, can you help me market my new product? And will automatically email some factories saying, hey, can I get this? And I think it would be super powerful if you could have maybe a couple of basic things in a year connected to this. So maybe I could say, I want to go to a romantic restaurant in this city where I'm traveling to. And then it will automatically start finding a couple of romantic restaurants, read up on what the most romantic restaurant is. And then also on my name, on my behalf, using my Gmail, email the restaurant owner asking, hey, can I have a table at that date, date? I think that would be amazing, these autonomous agents. If I could outsource buying Valentine's gifts and so forth, sign me up. Well, Anthony, I think Roland is in the dating app development business. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> These are good features to add, right? So Roland just, he didn't do a prediction. He gave us his product roadmap. <laughs> He's talking about his product roadmap, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think my prediction is, I think the LLMs are going to be a little bit more, I don't want to call mainstream, but a little bit more in the reach of the community, right? We heard about Langchain is an open source LLM framework technology, right? I mean, solutions like these will be more available next year, you know, and LLMs will not be just, you know, like closed source type of solution, right? So, okay, let's go to the last question and then we can conclude after that. So I know ChatGPT is more powerful because of a lot of the plugins that are available there, right? We can start with the Roland on this. So I want to ask you guys, like, what ChatGPT plugin would you like to see added next? Yeah, I think just how right now I am not remembering things anymore, but I remember how to Google for the things I want to remember. I think the next step would be a ChatGPT plugin for my life, such as maybe starting with WhatsApp and Gmail, such as it will remember things for me. So it would be like the Remember in Harry Potter where suddenly some ball will become red and you think, ah, I forgot something. And if we're lucky, if you upgrade to the premium version, it will also tell you what you forgot. <laughs> there you go. So basic model and the premium model, exactly. That helped me out. I forget a lot of things. Okay, how about you, Anthony? I kind of like in the restaurant plug-in. I think, Roland, you need to get on that for me. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Daniel? I would like to see something with voice, for example, the... Ask ChatGPT something and instead of typing and all that stuff, just like you do with Google or Alexa, so say something and the answer. And if the answer is good, for example, say answer an email that I have. And if the answer I like it, just send that email <laughs> without me touching the, the keyboard, something like that would be very nice. Yeah, that will help. Sharon, what do you think? Yeah, I'll give all my money to whatever plugin can make decisions for me. <laughs> just make my decision run my life for me and I'll be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I think for me, yeah, along the same lines, for me, I would like to have a plugin that will tell me what I don't know, I don't know, right? So <laughs> unknown unknowns. Okay, we can wrap it up, guys. You know, thanks for joining in this excellent podcast and sharing your insights and predictions, you know, what's happening in the AIML space and data engineering space. To our listeners, we hope you all enjoyed this podcast. Please visit infoq.com website and download the trends report that will be available along with this podcast regarding in next few weeks. And I hope you join us again for another podcast episode from InfoQ. So before we wrap up, any remarks you have, you know, we'll start with Daniel. No, I think it's going to be very important to see what is going to happen. And as I mentioned, I think AI is here to stay. So let's see how, if it's going to be good for humanity or bad for humanity, it's, it's, it's all going to depend on the way that everything develops. But I think this is a very new way to explore things that were before unexplored and the things are getting more approachable to all of us in terms of this technology. So we will see what is going to happen in terms of the use at the end of the humanity is going to give to this technology. Okay, Anthony? Definitely interesting times. Stay tuned to InfoQ.com to keep up with the trends and new developments. There you go. Roland? As a large language model, I'm unable to create any closing remarks. (laughs) (laughs) It will be available in the premium version, right? How about you, Sharon? Let me just quickly ask ChatGPT to generate a closing remark. (laughs) Yeah, it was so nice chatting with you all. And yeah, I hope the listeners enjoy our chit-chat. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So we will see you all next time and we'll see how many predictions have come true and what all happened, you know, in last one year when we talk again. So thank you. Have a great one. Until next time.